Uh, hi, Mark. How you doing? Hi, Kara. So last night, um, we, I started off, I had an interview with Margaret Vestager from the European Union, who's plaguing a lot of Silicon Valley companies. And I'm going to ask you the same question, because I think it's a really good one, which is how fucked is Silicon Valley right now in the atmosphere? Because you come from it from a different perspective. And you are Silicon Valley. I, I am Silicon Valley, yeah. I find that, it, I don't know if that verb is the right verb um, for Too it. Too strong? But, screwed? What? Well, listen, I, I'm in the enterprise side, uh, to, as you know. And my view of it is that the Valley really emerged, you know, 20-some years ago, uh -huh. uh, really as a company you might have heard of, IBM, sort of lost its technical leadership in whether it was microprocessors, operating systems, databases. Um, microprocessors went to Intel, as we know today, databases uh, to us, operating systems to a company called Sun that's mm -hmm. actually no longer uh, around, middleware to a bunch of different companies. And what's happened, Kara, I think is the customers have now bought all of these parts mm -hmm. sort of a la carte, had to put them together like Lego sets um, those have become very expensive, hard to maintain, frankly, hard to secure. And I think a little bit of what you hear now with this movement to the cloud is a little bit of this movement, maybe not even a little, movement back to a little bit more verticalization, a little bit more optimization. And that's going to have some interesting effects on the valley over the course of the next decade. But do you feel, you know, Oracle hasn't been involved in a lot of the Russia stuff around the social privacy, around the election and, and stuff like that. But one of, a couple of other companies that are sort of like Oracle have said to me that um, because of the issues that Facebook, uh, Google, Twitter, and others are having, uh, including with the government right now, that they feel like there's a viral contagion around tech, like big tech, and you have politicians discussing it. So how do you look at that? Because you all get lumped together and they were sort of irritated that they get pulled into that. I try to keep us as focused as I can on the mission at hand, which is for us to help customers. And, and we are really focused, Kara, to the point on the enterprise side, helping customers getting from where they are today to where they have to go. It's tough stuff. We try to stay as focused on that mission so as you, we possibly you're not, can. So you don't think there's something, you're not worried that big tech is gonna sort of get that stamp on it, that it's, that it's time to, to regulate more, be more negative towards it, do I worry about it that it could have some effect that impede uh, yeah. around the our globe. innovation around the globe or progress? Or your sure, I, I always worry about business. it. Um, I think the best thing as leaders, at least in our case, that we can do is keep ourselves focused on the mission of the customer, which is what we try very hard to do at Oracle. So you're a global company. Most yes. of these companies are global companies. Talk a little bit about where we are with the cloud business. Because again, we're going to get to security in a minute because that's, yeah. that's been one of the issues is whether they're secure, how easily these platforms are manipulated, how they're protected. But let's talk about where we are with the cloud right now. Where, where do you look at the, the business? Because you guys moved into it later than others and you had competitors. I like to think we came into it on a timely basis. Oh, all right, okay. I appreciate your point. Um, <laughs> That's a nice way, on a timely basis. Thank so. you. So, yeah, we're in, we're in uh, over 100 countries, mm -hmm. so we're very global. The cloud is a term used for many things, and that's mm -hmm. why I think sometimes when we talk about cloud, we, we talk past each other. Cloud has multiple elements, applications, platforms, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, I think that different parts of the cloud are at different parts of maturation. Uh, I made a couple of predictions a couple of years ago that uh, all of the production apps by 2025 will be in the cloud. Mm -hmm. All of dev test will be in the cloud uh, by the same time frame. I think two or three years ago when I made those statements, people viewed them to be aggressive. I think if anything, I may be proven to have been too slow. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is moving at, at, at light speed. Does it move a little different in certain geographies because of data privacy as an example? Um, yes. Does it, is there a little bit more regulation in some industries like banking, uh, telecommunications and others? Yes. Uh, that said, I think, I'll give you one statistic that you might find interesting. Last year alone, 16% of all the corporate data centers closed. Mm -hmm. 16%. And where is that going? That's moving to, to the cloud providers. So I think the pace, I don't think it'll be linear, Kara. Mm -hmm. I think you'll see the growth rate take some geometric moves up uh, in the next few years. Who, who, from your perspective, 
when you look at the key players in that happening besides Oracle, what do you think? Who do you think about when you're thinking? I think of it's different at each different layer that I described. I think at the infrastructure layer, you have uh, people like Amazon, Microsoft, um, ourselves. Um, <clears throat> at the platform layer, a little harder to see. Platform to us, by the way, is everything that's not infrastructure or an application. Mm -hmm. um, Microsoft, again, would have a platform like uh, .NET, Windows, uh, SQL Server. We'd have, obviously, Java, the Oracle database, um, and Linux. Mm -hmm. So those would probably be the two biggest platforms out there. And then SaaS has a set of application providers. You'd see uh, Salesforce.com. Oh, you said it. Good. OK, go ahead. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, they're a player out there. Um, ourselves. We're probably, though, Kara, today, the only suite provider, meaning right. you could get ERP, you know, uh, financials, uh, HCM, sales automation, marketing automation, all so together. Salesforce, Mark, who who's, has a lot to say most of the time, Mark Benioff, um, he says you don't talk about the number. Uh, he just, they just recently announced numbers yesterday. Can you talk about sort of where you are in that? Because that's where a lot of the attention goes uh, to that. I think, I think whatever he's saying, I know he, he's made comments about my talking about numbers. Um, I'd say remember two numbers, 20 and 62. Those are the only two numbers you need to remember. Those are your lottery numbers? Those are Salesforce's uh, predicted growth rate that I think they just put out last night. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be our last quarter's cloud growth rate. So, <laughs> a little dig at Mark Benioff. Um, Those are just numbers. They're yeah, just numbers. they're just numbers. Yeah, just numbers. numbers. So, you, when you're thinking about the cloud, one of the things that, that people are very concerned about, and again, getting to current events, is security around the uses, and in the case of Facebook and Google and others, the uses and abuse of these platforms. Um, the, the, I think everyone is concerned. When you had these databases and these centers, it was more, it was easier to keep control, although maybe perhaps not. But talk a little bit about security, because I think most companies now, and consumers, and especially here in Europe, are very worried about that issue. Okay, let me talk about security first from the current environment that's out there today. Um, if we have a, a vulnerability uh, that we would see in a piece of software, this thing gets created called a patch. This thing called a patch has gotten more publicity in the last you know, six months than it's ever had before. In fact, I actually had somebody in an interview ask me, could I actually describe what a patch is? Because mm -hmm. nobody knows what it is, but it's basically a, a, a patch onto a piece of software. When we release a patch, it roughly would take a year to get installed in all of our on-premise customers. Mm -hmm. So think about living with that vulnerability for a full year, we know about it, we've patched it, and you think of the Equifax yeah. uh, uh, That's penetration. That's what I was thinking about. Here's a, here's a case where they used some open source software. Uh, they had a patch that was available from the community, and it took them three months to get this patch uh, implemented. Now, they're a perfect example, in my opinion, of what people are looking for. Not that big a company, uh, doesn't have tremendous resources, yet has a treasure trove of, data. of information. Right. And, and, and so, it, apparently some executives who are not paying attention. So I think <laughs> you've got the issue where you have the opportunity now to say, OK, what can we now do about that? Mm -hmm. So in the case of what we would do in our cloud, we just announced that a, an autonomous database, autonomous database in our cloud, all driven by AI, that basically auto patches immediately. So if you were running the Oracle Cloud, you had Oracle database, you would get auto-patched at the time of the patch's release. That patching problem just goes away. So that's one, one, one issue. Uh, second issue, all the data in our cloud, customer data, would be encrypted. So you have the ability now, instead of uh, giving an example, again, a stat, of our database in the US, half of 1% of that data sitting on premise is encrypted, half of 1%. In our cloud, 100%. Mm -hmm. So you get the, all the benefits of security in the database layer, the encryption, the immediate patching. So I think it's almost, it's hard to imagine that you could ever be more secure on premise. And the reason carry right. it so hard is the point I was bringing up earlier. You've got all of these configurations on premise, different servers, different operating systems, 
different levels of even different databases and even different versions of our database. Mm -hmm. And so when you say patching, which it might sound like it's easy, it's actually really hard. No, I, I get that. I think one of the issues is that the security seems almost negligible for most customers when you have an Equifax thing. I mean, what kind of impact do you think that had? Because everyone feels utterly insecure about, I well, mean, I assume everything is available. My opinion, is that we're not going to have security taken as seriously as it needs to be until we have a large-scale event. A large-scale event, like yeah. the U.S. election? I mean, I don't know. What, what would be larger? Um, I mean, like here you I'm look, not going to send saying, out I'm ideas. I'm saying Equifax, enormous, the amount of data. Yahoo, the, ma the yeah. hacking. Yeah. Um, what, what, what would that mean? Uh, I mean, you don't have to predict a horrible digital N outcome. The 9-11 of data? Which would be what? I mean, you could imagine everything from grids to banking. I mean, you, you can come down a lot of things that could happen. Right. Um, and this has to be taken seriously. So just something as uh, simple as the patch example, which sounds so, so simple. Mm -hmm. um, we have to get that fixed because the quality of the bad guy. Remember that everybody thinks the bad guys are just professional bad guys. Mm -hmm. The line between who's a good guy and who's a bad guy is very thin. Mm -hmm. People who were bad guys become good guys and so forth, and they're very clever, capable people. They take advantage of, of lots of vulnerability. We get a chance yeah. to see uh, almost all of that art and get a chance to defend against it. And when you're sitting here in the environments most of our customers have, I, you're just extremely vulnerable. I mean, just to give you one last example. Okay. In our cloud, the number of configurations we have mm -hmm. One, one platform, one operating system, one version of the database. In our customers, the number of permutations of configurations can be hundreds. Right. Simply hundreds. Because of this a la carte, that there isn't. Because of this a la carte. Do you have to go back to a single company then? Because, you know, we, there was Microsoft, there was IBM. These big companies do look more monolithic than ever, to me at least. Feels like that in Silicon Valley right now. I, you know, I, I don't know that you have to go to uh, one company. I think you can look at, uh, I don't think the cloud is going to be a replication of on-premise, just to the cloud. The complexity on-prem moves to the complexity in the cloud. I think you'll see customers with a handful of scale cloud partners, um, three, four, perhaps a few application specific customers, but then a lot of work to make sure I can, I can make those clouds work together. And I have some abstraction there that allows me to, to, to leverage them against each other to a bit. But again, you're going to have to deal with, I've got to keep it simple. If I'm going to defend myself, I can't make it complicated. Right. I've got to make things easier to deal with. And it's hard to manage these environments as well. So I think people are going to err on the side of simplicity, more leverage uh, in the context of getting more optimization, more security than they did okay, before. I want to finish up talking about innovation and diversity. Um, you know, Oracle's an old line company compared to, it's been around longer than... Is that a compliment or a shot? I'm not both, sure. Both, yeah, okay. both, both. Okay. In today's world, it's a compliment now because it's a more mature company. Thank you. Um, thank you. But it's also an insult in a way. Um, in any case, um, <laughs> talk about how innovation, because one of the big topics in Silicon Valley now is diversity, the idea that innovation is dying a little bit. It feels maybe it's, we're in a cycle of that, of where is innovation. The bigger companies just seem bigger and also more vulnerable at the same time. So can you just finish up? We have about three minutes talking about how you think about innovation and how you keep that going. It's been largely, there's innovation globally, obviously, but most of the big innovation in the past 20 years have been in US-based companies, which have right. global footprints. Right. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, how do you think about, how do you, as a leader of the company, thinking about that? Well, we've worked very hard just even in this cloud world uh, itself to, uh, you know, R&D went from 3.7 billion, not uh, six years ago, to 5.2 billion um, this year. And a lot of that is frankly us reinventing ourselves, and if you will, cannibalizing ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we started cannibalizing ourselves. I think it's the best time to do it, which is when we're winning, right. as opposed to the alternative. And I think that drives not just in innovation technically, but I believe in innovation from a business model and a thinking perspective. You know, reinventing yourself in the public markets is not a popular thing. No. Um, when you have uh, the pressures we all have to deliver on quarters, we were having a very good, in fact, when I got to the company, our stock was like 20 bucks, went to 35 bucks. 
Um, and then we spent two and a half years at the same price, mm -hmm. basically with the same EPS. Why? Because we were investing in data centers. We were investing in rewriting basically everything we had. And that caused us to have more R&D. So I think innovation isn't just technical. Innovation's a mindset. And we have the benefit of, you know, to be very frank with you, having a founder who, who at its core is a, is a programmer. Mm -hmm. um, and he thinks about the world. By the way, I think one other benefit of of a founder is he thinks about things sort of generationally. He isn't thinking about, I'm not saying he's not concerned with a quarter or right. a year or something like that, but I can't tell you how many times Larry has uh, said to me, let's think about what happens 10 years from now, right. five years from now, and let's take this pain now. Right. Let's, go, let's go get on the other side of it. So, or 100 years, because he's planning on living that long, but go ahead. This is again, thank you, very thoughtful point. Um, and so, I, I think we've got it in our DNA, and I think it, it starts from the inception. But what are you what are you worried about when you think about that? Like, what is the what is the blocking? Is it government regulation? Because it seems like that's coming more strongly. Well, listen, we, all of our all of our as leaders, listen, all of our problems are inertia. I mean, particularly when you have companies that are doing well. You've brought up points about these successful monolithic companies, and it's very hard. It's easier to lead a company that's in deep trouble mm -hmm. because people understand it's in deep trouble. When you're, when you're winning and you have a certain cadence, very good point. inertia is really hard to interrupt. Explaining to people, we're winning, but I've decided, let's go here. People look at you and say, why? Mm -hmm. And you have to give a reasonable, rational explanation. And so I, I think we've been fortunate because of the culture in the company, which is always to sort of interrupt itself it's deep in the DNA of Oracle. And the last question, we just got a few seconds. What is the thing you are, if you had to predict out the, 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 the biggest thing going to happen in tech, what do you think the next thing is? You have like 10 seconds. 10 seconds. I mean, yeah. if I were to say the next biggest thing, other than this cloud and AI and everything yeah. else going on today, I think user interfaces change dramatically over the course of the next five years. This thing everybody's doing out here that I see pushing on a piece of glass, that'll be, the people will be showing pictures of that uh, to the next generation saying, what in the heck were these people doing? So, so what I does think, that replace it? I think it'll be voice, optical, it'll be all sorts of capabilities. We'll be able to now, with these new data models, uh, create enterprise apps that can do what you see the beginning of consumer apps doing. Be able to give you answers to questions immediately. AI will be integrated, not just as a solution, but integrated deeply into the applications uh, themselves. And also uh, in your brain, will you have a chip in your, would you do that, Mark? Listen, I'm, I'm telling you, I hear all this stuff about AI. I'm, I, I, there's so many positive benefits of what we're going to now get computers to do. Uh, that humans either can't do, don't have the time to do. Uh, the benefits are, are, are just, I stay focused on those. Great, Mark Hurd, thank you. All right, thank you.